Consider it a new stage in what the January 6th Select Committee called the Big Ripoff after raising millions of dollars from everyday Americans off of completely baseless claims of fraud, Donald Trump is now taking money from his supporters to help him fend off his mountain of legal troubles. Brand new reporting from the New York Times reveals that the ex-president has spent a staggering $50 million of donor money on his legal bills, and he has a lot of legal bills to pay. He faces 91 felony counts in four cases, a lawsuit that threatens to take down his family business, not to mention the millions he owes E. Jean Carroll after losing two lawsuits. From that New York Times reporting, quote, Mr. Trump has used funds in his political action committee, known as Save America, to underwrite his legal bills. The account was originally flooded with donations that were collected during the period immediately after the 2020 election, when he was making widespread and false claims of voter fraud. Well, with Save America's coffers nearly drained last year, Mr. Trump sought to refill them through a highly unusual transaction. He asked for a refund of $60 million that he had initially transferred to a different group, a pro-Trump super PAC called MAGA Inc., to support his 2024 campaign. In addition, Mr. Trump has been directing 10 percent of donations raised online to Save America, meaning 10 cents of every dollar he has received from supporters is going to a PAC that chiefly funds his lawyers. To give you a sense of just how much $50 million counts for in today's politics, Consider this. The New York Times reports, quote, his lone remaining rival in the 2024 Republican primary, Nikki Haley, raised roughly the same amount of money across all her committees in the last year as Mr. Trump's political accounts spent paying the bills stemming from his various legal defenses, including lawyers for witnesses. And the funds aren't just going to help Trump. They're also being used to help the people who are alleged to have enabled him to commit crimes. Once again, from the Times, Mr. Trump had also been paying some of the legal fees for aides who have been ensnared as witnesses in the various cases. Walt Nada, Mr. Trump's co-defendant in the documents case, is still on his campaign payroll. Another co-defendant in the case, Carlos de Oliveira, works at Mar-a-Lago. And that is where we start today with New York Times Washington correspondent Glenn Thrush. Also joining us, former congressman from Florida and MSNBC political analyst David Jolly and former U.S. attorney and co-host of the podcast Hashtag Sisters in Law, Joyce Vance. Glenn, let's start with you. We should note he has the right to spend the money he has raised on his legal fees. My question, are his supporters aware of just what it is he's doing? Well, I don't know if they're explicitly aware, but in general, and if you look at the polling in terms of the support that he receives on this, I think there is a general sense that what, wherever he goes, uh, they shall follow. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out is there was some consternation from uh, Trump supporters uh, when the special counsel, Jack Smith, was announced, and he's, the, he's overseeing two investigations, the Mar-a-Lago investigation and obviously the Jan 6 investigation. And over the same period of time, roughly speaking, prorated, Jack Smith has spent between 12 and $13 million on legal fees. That's not including all the security uh, that he's had to pay for because of the threats that he and his staff have been receiving. But just in terms of the actual outlay, and obviously he's not participating in either the Georgia case or the two civil cases, um, but just in terms of, of paying a very substantial number of prosecutors uh, and investigators at DOJ, we're looking at between 12 and 13 million by comparison. Joyce, all of the reporting I just shared with you, does it raise ethical questions or concerns for you? Well, it does, and it has ever since the January 6th committee included the big grift in their reporting. I think that there are a couple of possible venues where this could raise eyebrows. One is obviously the Justice Department. And to the point of Glenn's reporting, we don't know what people who were making these donations knew and whether there might be some form of a fraud case. But certainly from the original January 6th fundraising, that statute of limitations, which is five years, hasn't yet run. It's possible someone at DOJ is still looking at that and that this could get pushed into that mix. And then, Alicia, there's, of course, the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission, that oversees the propriety of donations and whether there are instances where problems come up. Uh, reports are made to them, and they investigate using bipartisan committee staff. But back in November, in connection with a case where allegations had been raised about impropriety in Trump fundraising, 
one of the commissioners, Eleanor, or Ellen Weintraub, released a report, and she made the point that the FEC really is at an internal bypass, where they don't seem to be able to move on any of these issues. She pointed out that there had been 28 complaints involving the former president, his family, uh, PACs related to him, where the bipartisan committee staff had wanted to investigate and not a single Republican designee on the FEC had voted to move any of those investigations forward, that would seem to foreclose that as an option here. David, I want to play for you some of what the January 6th Select Committee uncovered about Trump's fundraising efforts. The claims that the election was stolen were so successful. President Trump and his allies raised $250 million, nearly $100 million in the first week after the election. On November 9th, 2020, President Trump created a separate entity called the Save America PAC. Most of the money raised went to this newly created PAC, not to election-related litigation. The Select Committee discovered that the Save America PAC made millions of dollars of contributions to pro-Trump organizations, including $1 million to Trump Chief of Staff Mark Meadows' Charitable Foundation, $1 million to the America First Policy Institute, a conservative organization which employs several former Trump administration officials, $204,857 to the Trump Hotel Collection, and over $5 million to Event Strategies, Inc., the company that ran President Trump's January 6th rally on the ellipse. The evidence developed by the Select Committee highlights how the Trump campaign aggressively pushed false election claims to fundraise, telling supporters it would be used to fight voter fraud that did not exist. The emails continued through January 6, even as President Trump spoke on the ellipse. 30 minutes after the last fundraising email was sent, the Capitol was breached. There is a certain circularity here, David Jolly, right? He, he fundraised off the big lie. Now some of those funds are going towards help him avoid accountability for the insurrection he fomented over that same lie. Alicia, you're exactly right. There's two sides to this. Do, do donors have an awareness that their funds might actually be used for his legal expenses or for other expenses? Honestly, I think maybe they do at this point, right? We, we focus on Donald Trump kind of conflating the courtroom and the campaign trail into one enterprise. I think the donors do as well. Because every court case in the in the donor's eyes and the voter's eyes is about the deep state out to get Donald Trump and out to get the voters as well. So even with the fine print disclosures, it's it is certainly historically odd. I'm less concerned about a fraud on the donor based on the disclosures and the legal expenses. I'm far more curious about what an audit of the $50 million in legal expenses and an audit of his other expenses would actually turn out. Because just focus on the legal expenses first. Donald Trump hates to pay his lawyers. And even somebody with more lawsuits than alligators in a pond right now, $50 million in legal fees is a lot. And I would be curious just what is being attributed to legal fees when he makes those filings. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. What about everything else that the, that the receipts are being used on. I think the spending side of the column is probably going to be far more controversial than actually the solicitation of donations. Glenn Thrushman, David Jolly uh, raised the possibility of an audit. Your eyes lit up. I imagine that you have as many, if not more, questions than David does. I think that I think David hit the nail on the head. You're dealing with a tremendous uh, amount of money. Now, look, he, he does have significant expenses. And uh, a lot of, as we know, at least in the prior, prior three years, a lot of the really blue chip attorneys in D.C. and New York turned Trump down. So he's had to pay a bit of a premium for uh, forgetting people. But that, that is absolutely the case. This is just an inordinate amount of cash. It's certainly, you know, Trump talks about always boasts about the art of the deal and being able to get the best possible value out of this. Well, it's not his money, so perhaps he's not as concerned about it. But th this is an exorbitant number, and I think David is 100% is right. And, and to Joyce's point, the FEC has not functionally existed as a watchdog for over essentially a decade at this point in time. Citizens United gutted campaign finance law. So much of this is about this Wild West environment that we operate in. And as everyone knows by now, when you have uh, a road without guardrails, 
Donald Trump takes advantage of that situation. Well, let's talk just about another element of that Wild West. Just how complex is it that Trump is paying the legal fees of witnesses, of co-defendants? Where does that leave DOJ? That's a really interesting question. There, there uh, was a proceeding down in Florida called a Garcia hearing, which ad addressed this issue with, with Walt Nauda uh, uh, and the representation uh, one, of one of the lawyers, Stan Woodward, um, who I believe is also being paid through some of the Trump entities, who was representing several clients, including some people who were being interviewed uh, uh, about other clients. So, so there is a tremendous amount of entanglement here. Um, at the moment, Judge Cannon uh, was inclined to sort of allow things to proceed as they were going. But uh, I think as this gets untangled and more information comes to the fore, I think more and more questions are going to be raised. Right, Joyce.